Welcome to the Sports Entrepreneur Show powered by The Ninja Zone, the only podcast for sports entrepreneurs that gives you an inside look into what it takes to turn your passion for sports into a business. Hello, everyone. I'm Scott Rudisell, and welcome to the Sports Entrepreneur featuring Casey Wright and powered by The Ninja Zone. Our weekly dose of inspiration comes from your host, Casey Wright's own Instagram page, and you can follow her on Instagram at CaseyWrightNZ. This week's quote Casey shared is from Mumford & Sons, where you invest your love, you invest your life. And that's a great introduction to this week's episode. Today, Casey sits down with her longtime friend in the industry, Lynn Ledford, and they talk about what they love, business. Lynn has a passion for business. With over 20 years as a successful leader in child-based sports and education industries, Lynn is known as a decisive, analytical leader who guides with energy, high standards, compassion, and creativity. Her unique skill set features innovative thinking, strategic momentum-based action, optimistic leadership, and a boundless love for creating amazing, smart, successful children's businesses. A former lawyer and a college dean of academics, She jumped into the child-based education world by purchasing Cal Elite Kids with her business partner and grew a gym of 300 kids to over 3,000. She has opened swim schools in Chicago and California and opened a preschool gymnastics center in China. Lynn is committed to the growth and development of the youth sports and education industry and in 2012 she founded The Summit, an amazing professional development conference for leaders in child-based businesses. And it is amazing. I've been there twice. Here's Lynn and Casey's conversation. And be sure to stick around until the end where I'll give my top takeaways. Hello, Lynn Ledford. Welcome to the Sports Entrepreneur. How are you? Great. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Well, I'm excited for this one because... um, You've always, I've always looked up to you, not only as um, a businesswoman, but just, just a, a very kind person. And I've told you this before, but your relationship with your staff and your family, I love that your daughter works with you and that you travel together. And it's something that I just aspire to with my own kids. And, and thank you for being that, being that example for me. So I just, I really appreciate you coming on the show. <laughs> Glad to be here. There's so many things that I would um, like to pick your brain about because you have a plethora of knowledge in not just, uh, well, business in general, uh, all over the children's enrichment space. And I think we have so many people that are going to benefit from hearing you talk. So the one thing that I would love to start with, and just one question, what are you winning at right now? It's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm I'm winning at growth. I spent 20 years really in the throes of raising four children. And so when I got into this business, had one location and worked hard at that one location and, and trying to find the balance between being able to pay my bills and having fun at work and, and raising these, these children. So it was with some purpose and intent that I kept my focus on just one business. But I had a goal that as soon as these kids were um, up, up on, on their own, I, I wanted to expand. And, and the, good, the good side of that was when you're doing something for 20 years, running a business for 20 years with just one location, you, you can make mistakes. It's not that, it's not that um, compounding. So I made a lot of mistakes with little risk on one location. I feel like now I'm ready to um, really focus on my business, which I've longed to do for years. So what I'm winning and what I'm enjoying is um, expanding and growing the business and and really looking to lots of new opportunities and um, a lot of corporate moves. So when you say you can, when your focus is on one, you can make more mistakes because they aren't compounding. Explain, I, I get what you're saying, but explain that a little bit more. Well, if, let's say I put in a you know a, a training system and that and we we spend some money on it and we we create some online courses and we put that all together um, here for Cali one location affecting you know way back in the day let's say thirty or forty employees now we have you know over one hundred and fifty but 
if something is wrong with that system, if it doesn't work well, of course, it's a lot better if you're affecting 20 or 30 employees and not 150. Or let's say you have five or six locations and you have 650 to 1,000 employees, that's a compound effect. So it's just easier, you know, as you grow. For me, scaling and, and the speed of scale was important and it was delayed. Um, you know, at the time when I was doing this business, because as you know, Casey, I came in from the outside. I grew up in a tennis family. And although we made our living providing lessons in sports and sports and very, very similar, it was a whole different world. So for me, this was a, a business opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, wanting to scale that, I knew I had to time that. Um, I knew I had to wait until I, I didn't have these four kids because just learning the business and, you know, we don't have just gymnastics. We did scale within our own operations, you know, in, in calculated ways. We, we added a swim program. We added a, um, a, a preschool education, a licensed school. We scaled within ourselves that I had to manage that for, for my own sanity. I, I guess I kind of see it as, as your, your feedback loop is much shorter when you're small. And when it gets bigger, the problems are further away from you. So they can grow faster when the, you know, the weeds are. Yeah, actually, that's one very real aspect. You're not touching every little problem and every person that's affected. But, and, and equally important is there's just not as many people affected. You know, if you have a bad practice or a bad policy and it affects 30 or 40, 50 people or one group of families, you know, in one location, that's one thing. But, you know, if you have eight or nine locations and you, you've screwed something up times eight or nine, that's, that's just more to deal with, you know. So what I'm enjoying right now is I have paid my dues and I have learned the business in a, um, in a contained sense. And I'm really excited about taking that knowledge and now having the time to do a lot. I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm um, at the top of my game. So tell us a little bit about the expansion and, uh, you know, obviously you knew it was time to grow. Were there any, outside of, of being ready personally, are there any identifying factors within your own business that you, that kind of, you know, are, are little light bulbs that say, hey, let's, let's either do a no, new location or a new program or anything other than just gut instinct? Yeah, I think there's a few things. Number, I think number one is you have to have the systems to esp- expand. I mean, and everyone says that, but man, that is super real. If you don't have your systems dialed in, it's impossible to replicate what you're doing somewhere else. So really working hard, I think one of the keys to expansion is working hard at really defining, articulating, and documenting the system so that when you open up another location, it's really easy to, to replicate and it's 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 seamless. And then another super reality is you have to have the funds to be able to expand. And it took us a certain maturity. You know, we had to pay down debt. We had to build up equity. Um, so not only building your people and your systems, but having the money to expand. If you don't have the money, then you're taking on partners or you're going into debt service that it's easy to get in over your head. So that's all part of what was calculated for us. Now, we were aggressive in the beginning. You know, we, we bought a property or a business that was in a lease location with $4,000 a month. And the very next month, we jumped to 13000 And at the time, that's an, that was an aggressive move. That's my toilet paper now. But that was an aggressive move at the time. And then two and a half years later, we bought a building, you know, that was $3 million. And at the time in 1990, I'm sorry, that's about 2000 that was aggressive. So I'm not, it's not to say that we weren't aggressive, but we really had to manage our, our debt. And so now part of the ability to expand is that we've, we've got the financial infrastructure under us through growth and paying our debt down over time. So we don't have to take on you know, a bunch of partners or getting that outside equity to do what we want to do. So some of the things that we've done, we built a swim school. Georgette led this drive in Chicago. And it's a little standalone swim school, and we have a manager there. We had a gymnastics program, which we ended up divesting ourselves of. Uh, We expanded this year and bought a dance competitor around the corner and expanded our competitive dance program. We are building a pretty large, um, at least financially, another our third standalone swim school in Rancho Cucamonga. We bought the land for that, and that's a $5 million-plus project. 
And um, we expanded to Suzhou, China, and that is a preschool gymnastics operation, and it's a lot of fun. And we're really eyeing that right now in the future of that. But it's been a, a fun, you know, expansion has given our coaches opportunities to travel and to stay six months to a year in another culture in a really nice setting. And um, I, I think I've told you we're um, embarking upon a gymnastics, a preschool gymnastics licensing program. Mm-hmm. We're going to launch that um, at USA Gymnastics this summer. And we, um, I personally work on the summit, which is that educational conference. So those are all the, the ways and it's, it's really diverse and it's fun for me. And I'm just at a place where I can do it now, both with respect to family experience and the financial resources, sometimes by the hair of our chin chin chin, but we are <laughs> managing to do these things. <laughs> um, sometimes that's where it feels Fun. I I don't know. Maybe that's the just the entrepreneur brain. I was I was driving home the other day, and it was just one of those days that was just packed with just exciting things and problems like puzzles and and I was yeah. just driving home, and I was like, I just love this, and it's probably not good for my blood pressure, but I really do enjoy. <laughs> Me too. Well- this, this whole, like, oh, you're doing a podcast. Yes. What are you talking about? Business. And it was like, oh, it's your favorite topic. I do. I, I love business. I, I really do. And I love this business of children in sport that it makes me, I chose it. I chose it. And, and I love it. Every day I wake up and I literally think about what do I, not what do I have to do? What do I get to do? Like, I love yeah. our work. It's, it's great work. It it is, and and also being able to just wrap our families into it so much. Everything that I've done, even when I'm away from my children, I feel like I'm becoming better for them because of everything that my head is in. I mean, the, I'm such a better mom because mm. of not only coaching, but you know, just just after that, and the, and what we what we get to do. So I I one thousand percent agree. Yeah. So it's a family oriented business. It's family friendly, you know, in my prior world with law, your children don't come to work with you and they don't come to courthouses and they don't come to depositions and, and they see you when you get home. Whereas here, not only is our work relevant to children, but they can be with us so much. That's such a blessing. Speak to that just a little bit, Lynn, because I can tell you if, if there's other people out there like me, there was a time in my life where, you know, I would look at, a, at, at an attorney it's in, and a, just that, that professional degree and that education and, and really see that as something so unattainable. And yet you made the decision to switch from being an attorney to coming into the children's enrichment business. And I, I just think, I just think that's cool. For, it's just a cool story for people to hear and be grateful for, for where they are. So talk a little bit about your, your path there. Um, so my, my, the first path is, you know, the, the whole educational process. And I have never subscribed to the idea. And I know this is not necessarily a popular thought. I've never subscribed to the idea that you go to college so that you can have a job. I went to college so that I could learn. I mean, and that was absolutely the truth. My undergrad degree was in English. And as most people know, you, you know, that's, that's not a highly lucrative profession, English. Um, so that was, you know, but honestly, boy, that English degree has served me well my entire life. And then I went on to study law because I was very interested in the study of law. I didn't know if I wanted to be a lawyer, if I wanted to teach law, or if I wanted to go into business. But I knew that um, I loved nobody. You know, I wasn't married. I was single. I, I could do it at that time. And so I went on and, and I pretty quickly got through law school. And um, I, I started at 22 when I, was, when I was all done. So I did kind of hit that hard. And then um, practiced law for several years and then went into teaching. And then in order to make some more money, I became the dean of academics of a small school. So that was a great job until I had four children on my plate. And, and coming home at 11 o'clock at night was tough. And grading papers late at night was tough. And so my decision to seek something else was really based on wanting to have the perfect job that served me and my family well, and I wanted it to be a joyous job. Mm-hmm. So, so I, I really, you know, volitionally looked for what can I do in my own town that will be friendly to raising children, 
um, and that I could at least pay my bills. I never looked to really make a lot of money. I just knew I had to pay my share of the bills. And so I made some business plans about children's programs. And, um, and then I saw this little gymnastics club that ended up being for sale. My children attended there and we ended up doing it. Now, I will say that the law has served me well my entire career and that critical thinking, the ability to understand passages, you know, the ability, you know, there's a lot of people interaction that comes with law. Um, there's a lot of dealing with people in difficult situations that you get as a lawyer and getting people through crisis. So a lot of that has been very transferable, but I don't think anyone needs to be locked into a, a college degree or a certain career path. Your path has certainly changed and evolved and certainly your experiences and education that helps you do the things you want to do later. So it was a, it was a great time in my life, an important part of who I am, but um, I'm absolutely living my dream right now. I mean, absolutely. It, it really sounds like you have always followed your intuition and not something someone has set up for you. I mean, just to, just by saying I, I went to school to learn. Uh, I think a lot of people miss out on that. College, you know, it can be a financial decision for people, but I I mean, I think the life is a little too long to make that decision. Well, I would love to know if I, as a gymnastics school owner, want to add another program. I want to add dance, which I actually really do want to add dance. What are my first steps? What should I be thinking about? What questions should I be asking myself before I go into dance? Because quite frankly, I tried it several years ago and I failed miserably. So, yeah. so help me, help me. Okay. And I, I don't, I, I can't think of a, a, a particular order for some of the things that, that we consider here, but we certainly look at the market. Um, and there's n- we just look at it in its totality. So if there's a lot of um, activity in the market, that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. That means there's interest. Um, if there's no activity in that market, again, it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. it doesn't mean, oh, nobody wants to do this. But we do look at the market. And is this a growth? When we went to Ad Ninja, we looked at that market, Casey, to be honest. And, and we saw that as it wasn't happening too big around here yet. But we saw forward thinking that it was gaining momentum. Um, so we look at the market. Uh, we know, culturally speaking, that we do children. So I'm, I've never been in- interested or tempted in expanding into adult programming. Um, we know that we like to be the primary sport. So, for example, I wouldn't do sports conditioning for kids so that they could be better football players or soccer players because they're, that's not really, you know, we're the second fiddle and that doesn't interest me. Um, we look at um, the space, you know, the space that we have and if it aligns with our programs. And we try to have um, a thread that wa- winds in some way through all of our programs. So when they're really, really out there, like we tried wrestling, for example. And yes, it's a child-based business. Yes, we liked it because it might attract boys. That maybe could have been a warning sign for us. Um, but it was something that was interesting. Um, it used mats and you know similar training rooms and facilities, but what we didn't realize was it was a lot different than anything that that we do. You know, it was different types of, of employees, different types of culture. Um, it was a I don't want to say combative, but it was just a different mm-hmm. vibe than what we were used to, and we didn't do well with it. Everything else, you know, we have a performance based uh, theme here. So when we added aerial arts, brand new, kind of scary, we thought, how do we ensure it? Um, But it really weaved well with performing and athleticism and and art artistry. And then when we added preschool education, the goal there was we have these morning hours that, you know, there's only so many little ones that will do dance and gymnastics. How do we attract the rest of this market? Well, the rest of them, their parents are working. So that, that program, and that was a, a tough one for us to establish. It was, took a lot of work, but that it's an active learning academic license preschool. That was a great fit for us. So, you know, I, I'll tell you things I'm not afraid of. I'm not afraid of, well, I don't know anything about, you know, ballet, so I can't start a ballet program. I've never worried about that because I'm not going to teach those programs. I never have, never will. I hire people. So that, 
that to me shouldn't be a consideration. Mm -hmm. Um, that was, I'm glad you said that because that was the, I, I think for a lot of people, and I know it has been for myself, that that's the first question that comes to mind is, well, I don't know anything about this, but it's a, right. it's a, it's about the how, not the what. And it, right. If you're, right. if you're, if your job isn't the how, then that's not even on your radar. Yeah. And, and what I can do is I can hire people. I, I, I know I can hire people. I can create great jobs. Um, I can work with a team. That's all I need to worry about. And it's never mattered to me if I was hiring a swim teacher or someone to maintain the pool or an academic preschool teacher. Right now I'm looking for a bilingual academic director, front desk people. It's the same process mm -hmm. for me. And that is building a great team. I am super happy to let them go out and thrive in their area of expertise without me, you know, knowing enough about it to be over their shoulder or or, or babysitting, you know, their work. I look to the overall operations, the quality and, and the results and, and it's, it's worked beautifully. So it is fun. We're you know, adding new programs and we have some common denominators. We know it's children. We know it needs to weave into our culture. We look at the market. We do look at our space usage and make sure it makes sense with our space. We are always trying to balance space and usage, you know, like certainly mornings programs are tempting to us. Anything that needs more prime time space between three thirty and six thirty, we we always, you know, mm -hmm. have to really. That's challenging. Yeah. So yeah, those are some of the things we think about. When you uh, when you did the academic preschool, did you start that with like a mom's day out first, and then go into the full blown academic preschool? What we did there is it didn't. We knew we had preschoolers, and we knew there were preschool age children in our community, and we knew that there were very good preschool programs around us. So, so it it was a you know volitional choice to enter a in a busy marketplace. But um, I had you know I'm going to give a, a plug to continually seeking education. I had been involved in or attended lots of presentations where people talked about the benefits of gymnastics or swim or movement on learning. And I really bought into that. I mean, I, I really, really subscribed to the idea that children learn best when they move. So I thought there was a market there for creating a preschool program that was, um, that emphasized movement. So then along that line, and boy, we, we knew we could do that along that line though. I, I, I changed the path because I didn't want it to be a, a, gymna a program that was gymnastics, dance, and swimming. I, you know, th mm -hmm. that wasn't what I wanted. And I decided kind of against prevailing thought. I also did not want it to be a play-based program where imaginary play was the focus, which is quite popular with lots of preschool programs. And my thought for that is you can do that at home for free. Mm -hmm. So we decided it needed to be an academic program. And then we decided that it needed to be an activity-based academic program. So once once we landed on that, we, we knew we were perfect to do it. So we, we did hire people who had, you know, four-year degrees and certificates in, um, in early childhood education, and they were licensed teachers. And then we just started jumping through the hoops of, of getting that program to be licensed. And so ours was and is, um, we're licensed for 60 children at any given time. So we can have 60 in the morning, 60 in the afternoon, or they come full-time depending on what they do. We've kept it very flexible. We do have little uniforms um, and they do math and science. They have a little Spanish lesson. They all do violin. They do social science part of the year and musical theater part of the year. And they get gymnastics um, throughout the year. And then swimming is an optional add-on for us. It is one of our most favorite programs. Those parents are really integrated. They come you know, several times a week. Those kids pay anywhere from two hundred dollars a month to over a thousand dollars a month. It's good, you know, financial sense, and it really helps fill those morning hours. And most of those preschoolers, they also take swimming, they also take dance, they end up being on our teams. They just become really integrated kids. It was a beautiful fit for us having this facility already in the business of children, already having clientele in that age. Um, it really, it was an, it was just a it's just a great program. It is exciting going into these new programs. And uh, I remember just starting Ninja. And I mean, it was one class. 
we just tried it with one class. <laughs> it wasn't even like I'm going to go do a program. It was just started with mm-hmm. one class. Mm-hmm. And I remember being worried about, you know, whether or not that would go. <laughs> well, I remember, I remember seeing you at boot camp um, several years ago. You were, you were in, you know, the mix of getting ready to launch this. Yeah. And you came to boot camp, but only for a couple of days because I think you, you had a lot. Yeah, of I think time. I was going about five hundred miles an hour, being a chicken with my <laughs> head cut off, which is usually the first impression of me from yeah, a lot of people. What, I mean, who knew? I mean, like you, you had this vision and you had this idea, and you not none of us know, like yeah. no crystal ball. And you think, well, maybe it'll do this, or maybe it'll be do that, or you know, maybe we'll do nothing, but no harm, no foul. We're gonna get take a swing at this and look. Look what has happened, and how many? Oh my gosh! So it's just such a part of our everyday dialogue yeah. in gymnastics now. Is is these ninja programs? And in fact, I told you it came up a couple times at a meeting I had this week, and a couple leaders in the gymnastics industry, industry said, "I we think it's here to stay. We're we're going to start investing. We're going to we're going to do this." And certainly, all the you know the television exposure and and the, uh, the outside influences are, are are only helping and it's just it's fun to be on the ground level with little ones doing yeah that. and I, I think the the coolest thing when you when you look at it from a business angle and and anything like this so many people in business you know look at trends and what the market is doing but trends are trends or fads or, or whatever and things do come and go but five-year-olds, and six-year-olds, they don't lie, right? So those things, they haven't changed. What they enjoy is, is going to be what they enjoy <laughs> because they're not affected by marketing and trends and things like that. And, and I remember thinking that it, it's like, you know what, even, even if the adult wave of this comes and goes, these are energetic little kids, mostly boys, that are sweating, that you know what I mean, sweating and learning things. It's yeah, I think it's I think it's going to be here. Well, let's yeah. let's talk a little bit about uh, your conference, the summit, which I've been. I don't even know how many years. We all we love it yeah. so much. Oh, uh, professional development conference. Just tell tell us a little bit about it and um, how it got started, and then um, you know really why people should attend and I'm I'm a huge advocate but I want to hear it come from oh, you. Well thanks for asking that one. Um it started in the first event was 2012 and most of that event was at my house. And it started because I felt there was um a little bit of a gap in the various industries um with respect to providing uh educational opportunity uh, events conferences, topics, discussions that were aimed at either the more experienced or accomplished owner or someone who wanted to be more experienced and accomplished. And, you know, I go to, I go to all of our industry events every year. I go to all of them and I I always enjoy them, but it got to the point mainly because I'm older now It got to the point where I've heard that I've heard that I've heard that and I would be lucky to be writing down two or three things by the end of the event. And I know that those events, we have to take into consideration the whole general population of the industry. And it wouldn't be a successful event to, to have these topics that are you know, aimed a little higher. So that, that, you know, I hope that doesn't sound elitist, but really that was my intent. My intent was I want some really, really, really smart discussions. I want some honest discussions. I want some really entrepreneurial um, people in, in my, in my house to talk about business. So selfishly I invited, you know, 50 or so of my friends and they came and, and that's how it started. And then, um, and then it kind of grew a little bit and, um, and I've had fun growing it. So now we are at the uh, Riverside Convention Center and the Mission Inn, and we'll be there at least through 2022 and we're getting about 250 of what I consider to be the top, top, you know, one, two percent in the industry in both gymnastics, swimming. There's dance people, theater people there. Um, it's predominantly gymnastics. And then second will be swimming. And then we're getting people from all across the U.S. And then we have probably, you know, 20 or 30 internationals each event. And um, yeah, we're set this December for December 2nd through 4th. It's always in. Um, and around the very first week of December. And as you know, the Mission Inn is just over the top for holidays. So we're hitting them at their prime yeah. season. And it's, it's, it's a fun event. And it's a good agenda this year. 
and um, looking really looking forward to it. My planning for that is underway right now, just about ready to um, launch the website. It's being updated now with all the new 2019 information. Awesome. Well, we've we've had a great time there, um, both with Ninja Zone as a vendor, but then more importantly with my six facilities and these last couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> we well what we start just this last year we actually used it as a, our annual offsite so there were times where they actually split away did goals did metrics and used that as as our offsite so we really tried to do it in a way where not only we could justify you know the expense of flying from Indiana to California and and do all that but um just just to make it a true, just a culture builder and team bonding. And in just in that magical space, it was perfect. And then you guys, you know, we so kindly allowed us to host a little Ninja Zone mixer too. And so we got to see all of our our members there and it was just, Mm -hmm. it was awesome. So I think others are doing that. I've noticed on the room block, there's people staying for a week and I, you know, and then that's some, you know, there's been some, it's a romantic location. So I saw a little bit of that, but other people did the same thing. Well, since we're all together and we got our classes covered and we're, we're going to actually spend a day or two and, and do our management for the year planning. Yeah. That's yeah. good. That's awesome. Well, Lynn, thank you so much. This is, this has been great. And conversation, yeah. I just love, I I love how articulate you are and the big words that you use make me want to just keep reading. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, I mean, always such good information and you're so willing to help. So thank you for being on my thank podcast. You. Um, yeah. Could you, why don't you give our listeners where they can go online to find uh, summit information or, you know, just where, wherever. Yeah. yeah. Summit is, um, it's, CalEliteSummit.com. I'll be at Congress. I'm going to Region 1 and Region 6 and National, so I'll, I will be there. And people could always email me, and I'm on Facebook. Um, and if they want to chat about that or anything, you know, I, I love the industry and I love the people and happy to awesome. engage. Awesome. Well, thanks, Lynn. We'll talk to you. All right. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Clearly, both Lynn and Casey love what they do. It was evident throughout the entire conversation. A couple things really stuck out to me. Lynn's great advice on how to scale your business. Focus on one business to start and really define, articulate, and document your systems. That way you aren't compounding your mistakes as you expand. And have your funding in place too. Pay down your debts and build equity so you don't need partners or big loans. This ensures that you are working for yourself, not someone else, and you can wake up each day like Lynn does, not telling yourself what you have to do, but reminding yourself of what you get to do. Big difference. All right, that's it from us. If you have any comments or feedback, please share them by commenting on our site or by emailing us at podcast at theninjazone.com. Please be sure to visit our site for information on how you can get a hold of Lynn and find out more information about that great conference, The Summit. And if you like what you hear, leave us a review on iTunes, like our page, The Sports Entrepreneur, on Facebook, and share the love by sharing our podcast on social media and help us help others by spreading the word. Use our hashtag, The Sports Entrepreneur. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week.